Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 483. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's the 1st of February 2019. Welcome to another program. How you been doing, Gavin? Very well, Kevin. I, I, it, it's extremely busy. I'm very, uh, I, I'm, I'm blessed, and uh, life doesn't stop. <laughs> no, it doesn't. Well, George and I spent the first five minutes of our show talking about the weather, so we're not going to bore the audience uh, with that because we have meaty and important topics. If you didn't watch the previous show, George and I had the very difficult topic of abortion. Mm. <sighs> Uh, nobody should have to have to we shouldn't live in a society where that's even a discussion but we do um before you guys get too far into the program and before you decide if you like the program or not we need you to like the program go to youtube go to facebook there's usually this click on it um if you ha want to you need to well, you, not if you want to please just share the program with your friends clergy laity however you want to do it also you need to comment we have been getting lots and lots of comments on our program, so we really appreciate it. In fact, today we're going to read one of those comments. And you need to subscribe. We're almost up to 4,000 subscribers. Ooh. Now, you know, YouTube is generous to us, but we're not millennials. We don't have 34 million <laughs> subscribers like some of these kids do, but we're getting there one little subscriber at a time. So please click the subscribe button. And we have a podcast if you don't like looking at um <clears throat> three winsome people on screen you can download the podcast you find those in the show notes on our youtube channel okay so let's move to comments we did a show last week where you disclosed to our audience that one of the problems of the church of england is nobody knows nobody cares and that was in regards to international anglican politics what's going on here in america what's going on in africa and around the world that the Church of England in, in parish life can be very insular. Mm -hmm. And I was a bit surprised, but George wasn't too surprised. The commenters were not surprised. I wanted to read you one. Uh, I'm not going to use the person's name. If you want to go on the comment section and look it up, you can. Uh, I've been watching over the last hundred of the latest episodes of Anglican Unscripted, and prior to viewing them, I was unaware that the Anglican communion was worldwide. But I am one of those in an insular congregation in the UK. My father was a congregational minister, one of the old school who spent three years at the university studying Greek and Hebrew, followed by four years of training in a congregational college. Now, we have at least six or seven different comments uh, this week saying i didn't before the show or um we just weren't aware that the community was a a global ph phenomenon uh what do you think about these comments well i first of all think it's not the fault of the people who said that the oh, no, no not at all. It, should it, be attached to them at all. I, at think, all i think what it does is it tells us some really rather difficult things about the church in england um i'm afraid it reflects very badly on our sense of english superiority and self-confidence the fact is one of the wonderful things the Church of England did, people sometimes say, where's your good news? Well, retrospectively, the good news was that 100 years ago, there was a great uh, wave of missionaries, of people who took, who, who used colonialism rather like using Roman roads. Mm -hmm. uh, without, without endorsing the Roman Empire, the gospel traveled along Roman roads. Without endorsing English colonialism, the gospel traveled through the colonies. And... Um, very faithful and, and very passionate people planted Christianity in the form of Anglicanism. Um, <laughs> Pox you know, Anglo. <laughs> sorry. Yes, I, mean, even, I normally adjust them so they... No, that's of, all right. But you know, I have my, my earpiece is way too loud because... <laughs> <laughs> dong. <laughs> um, I, I think what we should learn is that our forebears two generations ago were full of fervor for the gospel. And, and we don't match up to them. I think also we should be reminded that in terms of the Church of England, do you remember there's this wonderful joke, Kevin, about um, the insularity of, of Great Britain when there was a news headline, I don't know, 1920s, 1930s, when the weather was bad round Dover, continent cut off by fog. And, you know, Anglican communion disappears because we, we, we don't look out there. Um, but the, 
very often people say to me when I, you've left the Church of England, well, you know, who do you think you are? What kind of Anglican do you think you are? You know, as if, the, and I say, well, um, the Anglican communion is 80 million strong and I, I belong to those, there, there's 60 million or so who take an orthodox view on matters of sexuality. And this is completely misunderstood, not understood, not recognized in the Church of England in Anglicanism here. There is no, there is neither, there's no, not only is no reference, there isn't any sense of responsibility. For, for some while, you may remember, one of the things that African Christians said to us is, please go easy on your pushing, well, they said this to tech too. That's right. please, please go easy on pushing for gay marriage because when you promote homosexual marriage, the Muslims we live amongst have, have a very fierce reaction. First of all, they have a more violent reaction to us, which they think is it is justified by our, our moral deviancy. And secondly, it makes it so much harder for us to share the gospel in our own culture. Well, there is this sense of self-sufficient uh, imperialism in England, which means people don't have any sense that what we do and say here has an effect on the way people receive Jesus elsewhere. And that's a, that's a sad thing. One of the things that I find when I get in discussions about the communion, everybody def defers to the authority. Well, it's not within the structures. You know, mm. you need to stick within the structures. And although there's never been an official vote or endorsement at any Lambeth or uh, any other communion, community about the structures these rumors of something that happened at the university of virginia is now or was it virginia tech ah who knows maybe a theological seminary these structures exist in some type of form and they're always referred to as official even though they're not um and that's one of the problems too nobody knows what nobody knows what's going on one of the things George and you have done so faithfully over the years is to expose the way in which the people who have run the Anglican Communion have lied and tricked and mm. cheated and been disingenuous. I'm sorry to use those very strong words, but that's what they've been doing. And I really do hope that um, faithful Orthodox Anglican bishops and archbishops across the Anglican Communion will realize that if, if Anglicanism is to manage the spirit of the age properly, they will need to separate from the whole Canterbury-driven progressive pansexual agenda. And it isn't enough. I've said this before, and please forgive me for saying it again. Uh, I'd like to persuade people of the case. It is not enough for GAFCON to send letters saying, we'd like you to reconsider your ways. They won't reconsider them. They haven't done. And there needs to be some distinctive, um, distinctive parting of the ways. Uh, in order for Orthodox Christianity to offer itself, to offer not itself, but to offer Jesus and mm. salvation and a, a, a church that aspires to integrity. Um, and at the moment, mired as we are in these worldwide political struggles, uh, I, 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 it's not being done and it can't be done. And one of the things it would allow us to do too is in, in this country, it would allow us to say, look, there are two ways of being Anglican, just as, as has happened in America. You have tech with all it stands for, and you have the ACNA. And although ACNA has its problems, it's great witness to say, we want to reform the church to keep it biblical and, and, and part of its, its faithful, uh, faithful to its inherit, inheritance. I, I wish that could happen in England as well. We're working for it. Yeah, it's it's a difficult situation. I want to quickly move over to some news we heard this week from England. Um, I got this email from a story published someplace. It says the House of Lords will vote this Friday on compelling. Sorry, let me <clears throat> start that over. See, for me, it's late afternoon. You're just <laughs> <laughs> late evening. People don't understand that we get slow at our age. <clears throat> The House of Lords will vote this Friday on compelling vicars from the Church of England and the Church of Wales to perform gay marriage ceremonies in a major blow to the freedom of religion. The amendment in the Civil Partnership's Marriage and Death Bill is a betrayal of promises made by politicians in 2013. Now, we've <laughs> I hope nobody is surprised by lying politicians or broken promises. But this has happened time and time again, where you give in a little, there's promises made, listen, it won't be a big deal, we won't make you do it, we're just going to have it as part of uh, the UK, it's going to have gay marriages, and um, we're not compelling anybody. Now we have an amendment, uh, and we're going to give you the breaking information in a minute, uh, that tells us 
yeah, we are going to compel you. We're going to make you uh, perform gay marriages. Well, we have always been saying that in the face of, of the so-called liberal progressive agenda, what begins by being permissive uh, ends up by being prescriptive. Always, 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 always. So, of course, they made these promises five years ago. And, of course, we knew then they were not going to hold. Well, this marks... Here goes the clock, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> well, well, the bell's not tolling for me. I'm good. <laughs> it, well, it's certainly tolling for our Christian culture. Mm -hmm. This marks the first official parliamentary attempt to tear up the promises and to force, to prescribe clergy to, to uh, celebrate uh, homosexual marriages. So it failed. The news is, I got an email just before we came on, it didn't work. Uh, and it partly didn't work because the government um, barked at the progressive lords who had put the amendment down, said they weren't in favour of it, they've withdrawn it, it'll be back. Uh, under another government at another time, it'll be back with more force. There's no question at all in my mind that it will get through at some stage. And that's one of the reasons why what we, we keep on saying we're in a fight that won't go away and in which they, they gain step by step by step. And uh, we have to do everything we can to say, look, here is a line. It, it can't be passed. We, we won't be part of this. And we need to make a distinction between ourselves and the Church of England, which, which is giving way step by step by step to the progressive agenda. I think the Labour Party would have said, hey, we'll try it. You know, yeah, we'll, I'm sure it would. You know, here in America, we we have the uh, the liberal Democrats have taken over Congress, and uh, hey, raise taxes to ninety percent. Ooh, let's take abortions to maybe a week after birth. You know, um, you just it's amazing what they're willing to suggest. And listen, if they get suggested enough and they try enough, so at some point, sometime in a weakened state, this country will just let it through. And well, it's not, it, it, it isn't just this either. In case anyone thinks we're, we're, we're obsessing about sex, uh, we didn't talk about this in the, in the pre-show uh, conversation, but um, the, the Lord has been very kindly giving me opportunity after opportunity to speak in the media. I'm, I'm, it's the Holy Spirit. I'm very glad of it. But today I was phoned up by the Sunday Times and they said, look, we're pursuing a story and we'd like a comment from you. We're not, we're not saying we'll use it. Um, they, they probably only use one out of every two I give them, but you know that's still amazing. I'm very grateful. But but they said the story we're pursuing is that um, it's all to do with the extremist legislation. So under Cameron, they discovered there were Islamic extremists. They were very surprised. And then 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 they said, in order not to appear to be just uh, hitting the Muslims, we better invent some Christian extremists. <laughs> so. So, they, because in order to be non-discriminatory, we must make sure this applies to Christian extremists and Jewish extremists. So then the um, uh, Off Ofsted, the educational bodies that examine people extremism, have decided that Christian extremism is different from Islamic extremism. Now, Islamic extremism is blowing people up and killing them. So uh, since you don't get any Christian or Jewish suicide bombers, um, what can they find to accuse Christians of in terms of extremism? And the answer is believing in a mother and father as the ideal for a family. And so there is a new project which has taken place. And what it intends to do is to ask all Christian camps that have to do with young people what they're teaching about marriage. And if they're teaching their children that marriage is between a man and a woman, then they intend to withdraw government sanctions uh, and to put a black mark by it. Now, what does that mean? Well, for the moment, not nothing very much, but it may mean you don't get insurance. It may mean you can't uh, you can't use the premises. Um, when I, I support uh, the Christian Concern and the Christian Legal Centre, and they often try and, and, and hire an, an Oxbridge College for their annual convention. Increasingly, over the last few years, they've noticed that the, these Christians take views that they consider to be homophobic and they won't rent them the property. These are small bits of persecution, small closing down of liberty and freedom, but it doesn't stop. And so at the moment, um, the, the fact that Christians believe in a, having a mother and father as a balanced, uh, productive uh, uh, family unit now counts at the same level in the same currency as blowing people up if you're a Muslim. This this is part of the progressive movement. And and you know, does the Church of England, do the Christians stand up and fight this? So far not so not, no. you know, not. Well this happened in Canada last year where the president or prime minister, sorry, of Canada uh 
proposed that, listen, we're not going to give out money to summer activities mm -hmm. if this, uh, your ministry, your camp or whatever is pro-life in any way. And that was, just, that was exactly just, the same. Yeah, that was the abortion industry. Yeah. This is now the uh, gay marriage industry, and they found ways to get to the money and deny the money to other uh, organizations and not for profits uh, at their will. And, and this, this is so like the 1930s to my mind. You know, was that was it that Neil Muller thing? You know, it, I they they came from the communists, and I didn't do anything. They right. came from the union. I didn't yeah. do anything. Then yeah. they, you know, they came from the other leader, and then they came for me. I do wish the church would wake up to say, uh, we must fight this every inch of the way and protest, because we know what the issues are. We know what the trajectory is. We know what the end game is. And yet, it isn't just the worldwide Anglican communion that people sitting in the pews are ignorant of. Um, there's a great deal of ignorance about how important this fight is and what will happen if and when we lose it. Times are changing. In 1950, I, and I'm bringing people up to speed here on a, a bill that was just passed in New York by Ge Governor Cuomo, mm -hmm. where they're going to have abortion up to birth, just another option if you go into labor. Uh, if that were proposed 40 years ago, the upcry from the church mm -hmm. would have been heard from mm -hmm. every pulpit, Roman Catholic, Methodist, uh, mm. Anglican, Southern Baptist, nobody would have been stopped. But now, over time, it's just not a big deal anymore. People just don't care. Kind of like we talked about with the Church of England last week and Anglicanism. Uh, they're just tired of society. And they either want to separate themselves, like the Benedictine option, or uh, just ignore it. And, and, and the great shame, the serious shame of our own culture, is that it's still true to say that about 40% of people identify as being Christian in some way or another. They don't practice. Practicing is down to 6 or 7%. But but the fact is that that's about the same number as the Muslims. Now, the, the media and the government know that the Muslim community will offer a solid vote. <laughs> they, they are, even only 6%, they are a force to be reckoned with politically. The Christians are, are, aren't reckoned with politically at all. Catholics are over abortion, but but that's it. It's it's greatly to our shame that some of the serious ethical issues, even freedom of speech, even the recognition that by offering offering rights uh, under equality legislation to the gay marriage lobby, we are contributing to the loss of freedom of speech and to the uh, the development of, of thought crime. Even that doesn't seem to have stirred Christians up to say we must make ourselves our votes known politically in the public sphere. It's it's greatly to our shame, in my view. No, absolutely. So let's transition to some other news. We're good at transitioning, especially late on a Friday. Have you had dinner yet? No. No. All right. So no. we'll, we'll transition quickly. That's one. If I if I look a bit desperate. <laughs> well, time, I've been time. waiting for news to break about resignations in the Church of England. And it hasn't uh, happened uh, yet. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's read this statement from Lord Carlisle. Um, I hope that this event, uh, Rebuilding Bridges, will add to the clamor for the church to admit uh, the awful mistakes it made in dealing with the substantiated allegations against Bishop B uh, Bell. His name should never have been publicized before allegations were investigated. Really? Okay, so that <laughs> these reports have been out now uh, for a week and uh, several months for the other reports. Nothing. So first, a piece of a advertising. Um, there's a wonderful man, Richard Simmons. He's he's slightly handicapped. He's deaf. Mm -hmm. uh, and single-handedly, he has run the campaign to reinstate George Bell. Uh, or he's paid for money out of his own pocket. He's been. He's got people like Peter Hitchens and Charles Moore of the Spectator. Very serious public players um, who have written column after column demanding the Church of England play fair over poor George Bell. So on this, on on Monday, this coming Monday at Chichester um, at the at Four Cannon Lane, uh, the rebuilding conference. Rebuilding Bridges Conference is taking place. If anybody can be there, please do. They've been kindly asked me to speak in the morning. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to do that. But um, it was perfectly clear from the Carlisle report. He was itching to declare Bell innocent, but he couldn't because of his terms of reference. Mm -hmm. And the quote that you've just read is the clearest example yet that he considers the Church of England's behaviour to be perfidious. Now, 
although fulsome apologies have been offered by uh, by the Archbishop, by the Safeguarding Committee, and by Martin Warner, apart from Martin Warner's, they've all been qualified. And the Archbishop's in particular was qualified by saying, well, um, okay, he's innocent. And then there's a but, as if he can't let it go. But, but what about the poor victim? What about needing to listen to the victim? Now, it's almost certain that the, I mean, the, the, it's almost certain there was abuse, and that's terrible. And it's very likely the abuse took place at the hands of a clergyman, and that's terrible. It's almost certain it wasn't Bishop George Bell and it wasn't in the palace in Chichester. Uh, and so for the Church of England to have thrown him to the wolves in order, perfectly clearly, to do th two things. One is to gain some credit that it was at last handling a sexual abuse case. Of a celebrity. Uh, of, a, of a kind of celebrity. Yeah. But the other is that it... it, it in the Archbishop's statement, it, it makes it clear that what he, he simply can't bring himself to support some very important Christian principles. One is innocent until proven guilty, and the other is you don't bear false witness, particularly on, on someone's posthumous reputation. And instead he slips in this victim narrative, but there's a victim. And, and if there's a victim, then that changes the scale of all the other ethical issues. Look, this is cultural Marxism. <laughs> this is this new spirit. This is this is the spirit of the age that has permeated the church and is behind all, all the perversions we're dealing with. And Archbishop Welby cannot bring himself to leave this inversion of, of values uh, and make a clean break and say, Bell was innocent, we fouled up at every stage, and he must be entirely rehabilitated. The buck gives it away. <laughs> Here in America, we had something interesting. We had Judge Kavanaugh nominations and hearings, and uh, <clears throat> oh, I'm not going to use that word. But uh, you know, it's a, it was a point of contention that uh, somebody had made an accusation that he had sexually molested or groped or whatever the allegation was, um, and then a couple more came forward, and a couple more came forward, and at at the top amount 83 individual women had come forward and filed complaints whatever happened to those complaints the moment judge kavanaugh sided on a court case with the liberals all 83 of those court cases disappeared now really? he didn't i don't think it was a quid pro quo i think they finally figured out he's not the enemy yeah you know that uh it was one of those you know, liberals support this side and conservatives support this side. And he, he, he was bound by the law. And mm -hmm. he, he followed the law. And the next day, uh, you find out that the FBI had dropped all 83 of those allegations. Yeah. Um, and what, what is going on in this world where allegations, and we know through Scripture that people lie, uh, have so much weight, it overrides the evidence. So one of the other things that's been in the news this week is the group that was behind giving advice to change the baptismal liturgy to allow transgendered people to use the liturgy to establish their new identity. One of the experts has resigned. Her name is, uh, his, her name is Dr. Christina Beardley, Beardsley. Uh, her she, she, he, is a, now a woman who was a man. And her reasons for resigning uh, are, to my mind, quite extraordinary. Um, it's, it's in the Church Times, but all the way through the narrative is, uh, I wasn't loved enough, the LGBTQI people aren't listened to enough, there isn't an exact balance of representative people on this committee, therefore there is an abuse of power, uh, and you know, you are neither, you're not hearing our stories, and you're not, by not taking our side 100%, you are somehow diminishing us, destroying us, and we feel bad. And so well, she's resigned. He, sure. she, he has resigned. I'm, I'm sorry. She, he feels the need to resign. But but the, the the narrative is is the one that is making people feel guilty about not dealing with this properly. And it's all to do with narcissism, feelings, uh, the whole therapeutic culture of am I being made to feel valuable enough in my own eyes? And if I'm not, I'm leaving. Uh, there isn't any sense at all that it's a church's task to mediate truth and love bound together in revelation in pursuit of holiness. 
Um, and the, the, that again, you just look at this and think, well, wow, and this is the culture that's seeping through the cracks day by day, month by month, year by year. I know Shahi has resigned. I'm very sorry about it. Um, I mean, part of me is glad that there is less traction from this um, from this this group because it will make no difference in the end. Living love and faith, LLF as it's called, is going to end up by being a platform for the new egalitarian, non-discriminatory, um, anti-biblical culture. There's a difference that, you know, that I practice, and that's between affirmation and acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. And the side with the LGTBs and the, the side with the, the victims and the sides always want affirmation. And the church has started to give them that instead of acknowledgement. If you are struggling with same-sex attraction, we acknowledge those feelings are real. And we are mm -hmm. as a church going to help minister to you. If you suffer from, you know, trans, uh, gender uh, dysphobia, um, we acknowledge your feelings are real. And we are going to help you with that. We'll be there for you and with you and stand by you instead of affirming it and saying, um, as a church, we affirm that uh, these feelings are uh, worthy of being blessed. And, and it's all, it, it all re that's exact, that's right. It all mm -hmm. represents the triumph of the therapy culture and, and God as a divine therapist mm -hmm. to whom we look only for unconditional affirmation. But actually the kingdom of heaven, as Jesus brought it, had nothing to do with these therapeutic values, nothing to do with that kind of affirmation. It has to do with salvation and transformation and repentance. And for as long as the church buys into this therapy culture, it's a different gospel. It's not the one, it's not the one Jesus brought or, or Paul preached. Jesus would fully acknowledge, I'm greedy. He'll never affirm it. Yes, indeed. <laughs> never. <laughs> and I'm really greedy. It's one of my sins. So great show. Uh, you, your, your camera has been slipping during the show. It's okay. <laughs> so People don't like looking at us anyway. They just do that podcast thing. Um, and we catch you next week. Uh, you, you're busy this weekend. Do any teachings anywhere? Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll be uh, back into uh, offering my homilies on the internet. And okay. then I go uh, next week, I go out to Chichester to give this talk for rebuilding bridges on, on the Monday. And then I'm going to be uh, joining Christian Concern and Christian Legal Center at the end of the week in London for some really quite important meetings, which prayer would be greatly appreciated. Absolutely. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm Gavin Ashton, and you've been listening to episode 483. Kevin, it's cheating when you put it up. I mean, <laughs> I, don't, I don't even have to. Just, everyone can see. Can well, listen, it it's not only really cheating, but I get to know who I am here. I'm acknowledging I'm Kevin and that you're Gavin. And uh, what else I got here? Oops, that's the wrong one. Uh, that's oh, George's. Yeah, you're not George. Uh, and for, you, for people who struggle with the date, today is February 1st, and it does cheat, but, you know, that's something that's really been getting us, you know, the last at least 100 episodes. I would start out with the wrong episode, or you guys would finish with the wrong episode. We just weren't recording the same episode. It's true. It's true. Kevin, thank you very much. God bless everybody.